We're looking at fear not in Isaiah. Fear not. In Isaiah chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint hearted. Here the Lord sent his prophet, his servant, to this man that had a challenge. And he said, say unto him, declare unto him, make it plain and clear unto him. Take heed, that is, watch your heart, what goes on in your heart, what goes on in your mind, and then tell him, fear not, be not faint-hearted. And then he goes on to say, the reason why he told him, fear not. Look at verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and, be, and bear a son and shall call his name. What's the name? Emmanuel, God with us. Because Emmanuel is God with us. And because greater is he that is with us than he that is in the world. And greater is he that is in us. Than he that is in the world. That's why he's saying, fear not. There is nothing to fear, knowing who is for us, who is within us, who is around us, who is behind us, and who is before us. Fear not. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54. We're looking at verse 4. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Uh, what makes people afraid? They think, I'm going to be embarrassed before the people. I'm going to be disgraced before my peers. And I'm going to feel this reproach before my countrymen. Because of that, they're afraid of what has not come. Because they think it may come. But the Lord is saying, there's nothing to fear. Because that reproach will not come. And that shame will not come. And that calamity will not come because of that, he says, fear not, because you will not see the shame, you will not be ashamed. Neither shalt thou be confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Look at verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Isn't that what people are afraid of every time? They are afraid of witches, of wizards, of weapons of darkness. They are afraid of the sea, of the ocean, of the forest, of what goes on in the village. They are afraid of what the enemies are planning against them. The plot and all those things that those enemies are saying will get him down. But he cannot do it. Because he says, no weapon that is fashioned against you, formed against you, can prosper. And then it says, every tongue... Every what? Tell me out loud. The strong and the weak, the magical and the idolatrous, every tongue, whatever they are, wherever they are coming from, however sharp that tongue may be, and however demonic or devilish that tongue may be, it says, every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. And then it says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, says the Lord. And so you see why the Lord is telling us, he says, fear not, is for us, is by us, is supporting us, and is supplying all our needs. And because of that, he says, there is nothing to fear from tonight. 
you'll not be afraid in Jesus' name. I want to find out, number one, what's the definition of the description of fear? The definition and description of fear. Because if you don't know what fear is all about, you might have it and not know that you have it. And when it's trying to knock at the door and it's trying to come in, you will not know that that is fear coming in because it may disguise itself and you will not know. And here you're saying, I will not fear, I will not fear. And fear is knocking at the door and you're opening the door and it's entering in and you're still saying, I will not fear. What then is the definition of fear, the description of fear? Number two, we're looking at divine declaration to the fearful. If you're fearful, you're timid, it looks like, you know, your knees are shaking every time. And your mind is kind of oppressed every time. You're under fear and intimidation every time. What's the declaration of God for you or to you? The divine declaration to the fearful. Number three is deliverance and dominion over fear. We're going to overcome. Deliverance from fear and dominion over fear. Now, this point, number one, is very important. Everything is important, but number one is so important, the definition and the description of fear. What is fear? You're going to do a lot of writing. Are you there? Do you have your virus, pens, pens up? I want to see. Uh-huh. Pens now. You remember? What's fear? Now, you spell that fear, F-E-A-R. What's fear? False experience appearing real it's not real it's not real it appears real and because of that many people are afraid and they are afraid of shadows they are afraid of mirage they are afraid of something a fantasy something that is not really there i want you to look at second kings chapter three second kings chapter three and I'm reading from verse 22, 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 22. And they all suffered in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. They were on the battlefield, and there was a river nearby. And they were preparing, they were ready to take on the enemy all of a sudden in the morning. You know how the sun is in the morning. It's not as bright, it's not as white. It's like almost yellow and red together, purple together. And when they saw the sun shining on the river, look at what they said. It looked like blood in verse 23. And they said, this is what? Was that blood? No, it was water. That's just false experience appearing real that made them afraid remember they were on the battlefield and remember as they were on the battlefield wanting to engage the other part of the army then they saw a pool of what they thought was a pool of blood and he said all the people are dead something has happened something mysterious has happened to them and all of them are dead and the decision they took, they took that decision on the basis of what they saw and they thought it was blood. How many times you have acted like that and you thought you saw something real. And it's just something that was a kind of a mirage, a kind of shadow in your heart. And then your interpretation said it was a demon. Your interpretation said this is Satan. Your interpretation said they have come again. Those are the enemies. They are going to take me on. And when there was nothing to fear, you were afraid. And sometimes it's not even prayer, and it's not fasting. It's just to think about it and look at it very carefully. And look at it again. Let somebody get near this water and pick up and draw some water out of that. You are going to see it is not blood at all. But without looking at anything or examining anything, they said, this is blood. And the decision that followed after that was that, you know, just fell. There's no fighting anymore. All the people are dead. And they walked into the enemy territory without their weapons on. They were all dead before the following day. False experience appearing real. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 7. Second Kings chapter 7. Here we find uh, the people of Syria, their army. They were fighting against the children of Israel. 
And as we're fighting against the children of Israel, look at what happened in verse 6, chapter 7, verse 6. And the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and did what? And they fled. The king, if you read the whole story, this is the time when Elisha said, By this time tomorrow, we'll sell the, uh, the wheat and all the things they're going to eat. We'll sell it at the gate for a cheap price. And the man leaning on the right hand side of the king said, That cannot be, even if the Lord will open the windows of heaven. And then Elisha said, You'll see it with your eyes, but you'll not eat out of it. And the following morning, this uh, king with his army, they heard a blast. It's like a bombshell. And he said, the king of Israel. And the king of Israel, by the way, is at home. is in this palace, fearful, afraid. Because when the lepers, when they went in there, and they saw the food, and they gathered, and they said, we're not doing well. Let's go to the king and give him information. When they informed the king, the king himself was afraid. And he said, I know what those people have done. They want to deceive us, and they are somewhere. And then when we go out, because they know we're hungry, they're going to pounce on us and kill us. Now, he was afraid. They were afraid because they had something. And what they had was not real. And he said, we're very sure. You are the one that makes the conclusion yourself. And then you begin to paint the picture. I'm gone. I'm through. I'm dead. They have come to take me, and there's nobody running after you. And we're just fearing because it's Paul's experience appearing real. Number two, faceless enemies afflicting reason. Faceless enemies. That's fear. Faithless enemies afflicting reason. That is, your reasoning faculty is afflicted because of faceless enemies. Enemies that you don't see. Enemies that are not there. And how many times we are praying and we say, God, destroy those enemies. And where are they? Lord, get rid of them. And then we fast and pray and cast out and cast off and whatever. And those enemies we are fighting, they are faceless enemies. But they afflict our reasoning. We are not able to reason well. Because we think the enemy is there, the enemy is there, the enemy is there. Look at Psalm 53, verse 5. Psalm 53, verse 5. And there are things you don't even have to fight at all because they're not even there. It says in 53, verse 5, in the Psalms, look at that, it says, Psalm 53, verse 5, there were they in what kind of fear? Great fear. Tell me the rest. Where no fear was. They were in great fear. Where no fear was. And that's why as we talk about fear not, we don't just want to come and start casting out and casting off and stamping and, you know, jumping on it, trampling on this and trampling on that. Maybe we're trampling on something that is not even there. Maybe we're trying to cast out something that is not even there. And all we need to do is evaluate and examine and see what are we afraid about? And what is it we're really praying about? And here it says they were in great fear, great, great fear. And yet it says where no fear was. What is fear then? Number two, faceless enemies. We don't even know them. They don't show up. But their faceless enemies afflicting our reasoning faculty. Number three, frequently expected adversity realized. Frequently expected adversity realized. That, that's fear. Look at Job chapter 3. In Job chapter 3, you've been wondering how could that happen to Job? He attracted it by the fear that he had. Let's look at Job chapter 3, verse 25. It says, For the sin which I greatly feared is come upon me. And then he said, And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Then he said in verse 26, I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. He said, I, he was rich, but he was not in safety. 
and he had all these children and a good wife and he was not in security or safety and he said he had been afraid every time what does that mean every time he woke up he said i wonder whether these children will still remain alive by the time I get home, and they need to be taking care of me. And because of that fear, and that fear, and that fear, the fear, actually fear is a form of faith in the negative. As your faith attracts the fulfillment of the promises of God, so fear will attract all the causes and all the things you're afraid about. And that's why Job himself said, this chapter 3, something had happened in chapter 1. Something happened in chapter 2. As he sat back and he said, now I understand. This is not new. This is what I've been fearing all the time. And Job, why were you fearing that all the time? I think Satan had more information about Job than Job himself had. You know what Satan said? God, you have made a hedge around him. I cannot even penetrate and I cannot destroy what he has. About his house, about his children, about his family, you have made a hedge around them. And Job never knew that. And he feared unnecessarily. And now when everything came, he now said, for the sin which I greatly feared, greatly, greatly feared, is come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Was fear then frequently expected adversity now realized number four fantasized exaggeration above reality that's fear uh, there's a little idea there's a little thought that comes to you and then you start expanding it and building on it and it's growing up and it's all fantasy and you fa fantasize that exaggeration above above reality and let's look at numbers chapter 13 numbers chapter 13 and this is what people fear and you think about what you know pentecostal churches are doing today and the deliverance ministers what they're doing many times we're just wasting precious time fighting enemies that are not there and many times we're just praying and saying instead of sit the person down and say now what are you afraid about let the fellow talk and let the fellow explain to you what is it he's afraid about or she's afraid about and then after that explanation then you will know whether what he needs is not prayer but some explanation and teaching from the word of god so that we'll know that this kind of fear f-e-a-r may just be fantasized exaggeration above reality i want you to look at numbers chapter 13 this kind of exaggeration above reality. We're looking at chapter 13 of Numbers, verse 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Enoch, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as what? I think uh, that that's, that's exaggeration. You've seen grasshoppers before. A uh, grasshopper is not up to, you know, my feast very small maybe like these two fingers and then you'll see a whole man like a giant and it says we the israelites are, are how can you say that we know that there have been slaves in egypt and we know that when somebody is doing manual work his muscles are developed and we know that these people didn't have any chariot and they were walking from egypt and they were walking to the land of promise these were strong people and these were people that they have been developed physically. And yet they are now telling us that in comparison, they are grasshoppers to those giants. That's what they look 